Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information. The Troglies Guitar Show. Here we go. What did I get this week? So we need to discuss the fate of the Electra MPC. That guitar was hard to let go, but unfortunately I did. I'd only gotten one trade offer that I was actually interested in, and it was a Sully Erna Les Paul. I've been wanting to document one of those, and that was a really nice offer on his part. But unfortunately, something just happened where he traded it off. He probably got a better deal anyways. And this eventually ended up selling on Reverb for $500 plus 65 shipping. Once you take out the um. Reverb and PayPal fees and the $65 to ship it, we were left with about $463. So yeah, here's what I bought. It didn't quite take up all of our funds, but it came close. But I think with all the other stuff that Robert Baker traded me, some of it might sell, some of it might trade. I think it'll even out. We're probably getting close to the end of season two. This season's kind of been a little bit messy to say the least. Season one, I kind of kept it simple and just did guitar for guitar trades or one-on-one. -on -one, but I knew driving up to Michigan for the first trade was the right idea on this one in order to, you know, get us to our goal quicker. It's a messy trade, but hey, we've had quite a lot of fun this season. So there's actually a little bit of history behind this guitar. It was listed on Reverb and I wanted it, but you know, I, I have a bad habit of, you know, I always try to get the deal to be just a little bit sweeter. I made an offer and then somebody just hit the buy it now price. And when that happened, I was absolutely gutted. It was right before I was going to sleep and I was like, ah, I should have just bought it now. I forgot about it. And I thought about messaging the guy saying, hey, if something doesn't pan out, let me know. I would be interested. But I didn't. But a week later, it shows back up. Now, I don't know if it was returned and there's something wrong with it here, but it sounded like the guy was upset that the pickups had been replaced. And I don't know about you guys, but a pickup swap on a, I think, is it a Korean made guitar? Yeah, that's not a big deal to me. If anything, I welcome it. So this is a Mike Mashuk, and I'll be honest, I have no idea who that is right now. I'll do a little bit of research and then tell you guys on the bench. But we've got some sort of Seymour Duncan that looks like a DiMarzio of some sort, but it's a beautiful silver burst finish. But the other reason why I wanted it is it's a baritone. A few weeks ago, I thought I'd give the Reverb app a try again, and it tried to sign me up again and it wanted to know my preferences. So I let him know like Gibson's, but then in the suggested was Baritone. So I clicked on that, but then it's like, hey, you already have an account, but somehow that got added to my account anyway. So I've been seeing all these new Baritone guitars. So this is one, I just wanted to buy it anyway, so I'm glad it could be a part of a different series besides me just buying it. But yeah, extended scale length, similar to my Buckethead Les Pauls that I love so much. So I am definitely very interested in giving this one a try to see if maybe it's just baritone guitars I like and not just Buckethead. So we'll take a quick first look here. I finally found out why this thing was so cheap. I kind of feel lied to, but since I didn't catch this right away when this arrived, I'm not sure if Reverb's gonna back me up or not. So in the original sales ad, you can just see a little bit of chipping to the finish right there. Not a big deal, right? But then you view it from the edge and there's quite a significant loss of finish right there. Now to me, it looks like it might just be cosmetic. Like the neck got a ding to it and kind of chipped the finish. The neck set itself, to me anyways, it looks okay. It just looks like the finish might have chipped a little bit. So, I mean, is the guitar useless? No, but it's definitely something I'll be forthcoming about when I trade and or sell this off. Another thing I'm noticing is this is a bridge pickup in the neck position. You can tell because the pull pieces are supposed to be the opposite way, right? If I were to flip this around, Seymour Duncan would then be upside down. So I'm not sure I might have to switch those pickups and <laughs> decide something. But other than that, it's just a little bit dirty. I can clean that up, that's no problem. Got a few nicks and dings right there. Hopefully all the electronics work. But besides that, it looks like our fretboard needs cleaned. It's got quite a bit of finger gunk going on here. But the headstock, surprisingly clean. Backside of the guitar, it's definitely been used, so it must be a pretty good player at least. So let's go ahead and fast forward through all this other stuff. 
This is a signature guitar for Mike Mushak. I mispronounced his name the first time. I didn't get took on the Mushuk, I got a Mushak. He's best known for his work with Stained, but he's also been playing with a few other bands. But what's kind of historic with this guitar, it is the first production baritone by PRS. They made them from 2008 until 2014 in Korea and offered them in three finishes, Brown Burst, Silver Burst, and Vintage Cherry. They were then replaced by the PRS SE277 model. Based on recently sold listings, these appear to be worth anywhere between $450 to $600. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at these pickups now. So on top of this actually being a bridge pickup, it also has the bridge pickup ring, whereas the bridge pickup itself has the neck pickup ring. I would swap them, but it really doesn't seem to make a huge difference in this case. Like on a Les Paul, yeah, the neck pickup would be touching the strings. But this is a Duncan SH-15. And what that means is it's an alternative eight pickup. They run about $95 new. And what's special about these is they use an Alnico 8 magnet for extra high output. I mean, this thing was built for high gain. Even the website says it's mainly suggested as a bridge pickup and it pairs well with the 59 or jazz models in the neck. So I guess we'll see how that functions in the neck position. And then down here, we've got one that just kind of has the hex key pole pieces and it's a DiMarzio DP220BK. And that stands for a deactivator. Essentially their marketing gimmick for that is they looked at active pickups, they kept all the best parts of them, but ditched all the bad stuff like the nine volt battery and how lifeless some people think they sound. Originally, this would have just had PRS design treble bass pickups. I bet those things are probably worth, what, 30, 40 bucks on the used market. This set, it's probably worth at least around 100 bucks, maybe a little bit more together. So it's an upgrade in my opinion, even though they're kind of in weird positions. I was originally thinking I could just swap these around and then it'd be okay, everything would be set up. But unfortunately, the lead length for this one would not be long enough to do that. So I'm just gonna let it be. And I'm not really sure the fate of this guitar, but I'm going to go ahead and film and record this anyways. He's been very responsive, apologetic. I, I think he's offering me a return or a refund, so we'll see how this goes. It's possible it could have been shipping damage. Looking in here, it seems like the neck is fine. I mean, there's a small little join line right there. However, you also have that on the other side, so I really don't think any separation has occurred. He told me that he caused this, so I'm wondering if this just got hit in shipping and it just kind of caused that cracking line to appear, and then it kind of chipped the finish there. But the guitar holds string tension, so that's good. But you've got some light polishing scratches. I was happy all that kind of gunk came off of right here and wasn't like an impression in the finish. You do have a ding right there. I knew about that though when I was purchasing it. But everything else, I would say it cleaned up pretty good. Got master volume, master tone, and this is a three-way toggle switch, so no coil splitting. Nope. <laughs> and it uses a string through bridge style. Spec-wise, we're rocking a pure mahogany body, so I don't believe there's any kind of top. The website says it's a white binding, but it's more of like a cream color. It works. And then that's paired with a maple neck. I guess that's one good thing about that finish chip there is you can see the maple neck, but I was impressed to find an ebony fretboard on here. Sometimes on these import models, I don't know if I believe them of what they say the woods are made of or not, but this definitely looks like a pretty nice piece of ebony. Maybe it was originally like a streaky kind that they dyed black, but this thing cleaned up very well. No more finger gunk. The frets shined up nicely. But something that I kind of found funny here is I'm used to seeing fret wear on like the top portions of the frets and like cowboy cord area, but this one... It only has the divots on the low strings because, you know, it's kind of a, a genty guitar, I would say, being a baritone. But none of this fretware really affects the guitar at this point in time. The truss rack cover reads PRS and then SE. SE is basically PRS's import brand, kind of like Gibson's Epiphone. And then you can see Mike Mushak, his name's right there. I'm measuring a 1.68 inch nut width. Then by the 12th, it's 2.06. First fret neck depth, 0.85. 12.95 and the website says it's a 27.7 inch scale now remember the bucket heads are only 27 so this is even furtherly extended than those guys so this is the longest scale length guitar that i've ever played but for some reason i think this extended scale length makes this prs design look better i mean i'm one of those guys where 
I think PRS guitars have really nice fancy woods on them, but maybe it's just because I'm not a double cut Les Paul guy. I just always thought the shape wasn't quite as attractive as some of the other designs on the market, but I think it looks great with this. Maybe it's just because I like the silver burst finish. And the other thing I was kind of surprised about is it's only 22 frets. I figured something like this super scale linked out would be at least 24, but no. Moving on to the back of the guitar here, it cleaned up all right too, but you still have all the scratches, nicks and dings everywhere. Now this was definitely amateur hour back here. The wires are not super securely attached, so keep that in mind that you might want to touch some of that up in the future. But I'm hoping it at least works as it is now or else I'll come back and do it. But it looks like you have 500k pots in here. This is another thing I find weird about PRS is they have these gigantic heels to them. I'm not quite sure why, so if you do, let me know. Moving up the back of the neck here, I don't see any major nicks or dings. And the serial numbers for these. To date this particular version of an SE, you look at the first letter. So from 2000 till 2014, as you can see on this chart, they used a different leading letter for what year it is. K stands for 2010. So this is a 2010 Mike Mushock signature PRS SE. We've got this style of output jack and it looks like the only other upgraded part besides the pickups are Schaller strap locks, both on the bottom and here on the top. And for being a solid mahogany body, it's ridiculously lightweight, six pounds, 7.1 ounces. Let's go ahead and plug it in. final thoughts on the Mike Mushock PRS SE signature guitar. I liked it. 
I don't like it as much as I like the Buckethead guitar, but it was still a nice experience to get to try out a different baritone guitar. Now, the whole reason to have a baritone guitar is for the lower tunings because the longer scale length allows it to eat up the extra tension. So you can have super low tunings, but it still feels normal. There's not a bunch of slack in it. But honestly, I like my baritone guitars tuned to standard with regular gauge strings because I think it just makes regular stuff sound fantastic. This one came to me with a pretty heavy gauge string on though. So I just did, I believe it's drop A tuning and then B tuning for some of the other playing demos. So playing this thing, I noticed that, you know, the scale length messes with you at first because normally I'll pick in between the pickups. I found myself just naturally always being over the neck humbucker for this thing. It's, it's a pretty long neck, but I don't think it looks crazily out of place. So I'm definitely glad I got to check this thing out for a little bit. And after speaking with the seller, he was really apologetic. Maybe it really did happen in shipping, who knows? But he agreed to a $100 partial refund. So that brings our grand total for this guitar to be $240, which is really good considering these are normally 450 to 600, but it's an issues guitar. So we'll have to see what we can trade this for. So currently in our Trade Tuesday stash, we've got the two Bantams. One of them's actually already spoken for, but for all intents and purposes, it's still here. Not ready to share that story yet, not quite complete. But the Blue Jay is still available. We have the two Dan Electros. We've got this Mike Mushock and we have $223 cash. So we have roughly $1,400 worth of gear. So as I was saying, we're getting close to the end of Trade Tuesday season two, because you can start to get a custom shop guitar around $2,000 or so. So as always, if you are interested in trading me something for this guitar, email me directly at tradetrogly at gmail.com. You can check the availability of the guitar with the reverb listings that you can find in the description. Overall, this thing, it's in pretty good shape. We've got a few nicks and dings on the top as we were talking about earlier. And you've got the buckle worming and scratches on the back. We've got the finish cracking by the heel, but honestly, I've played this guitar, I felt it. I really don't believe that's gonna cause you any issues. I even did a little bit of a touch-up job there. So it didn't look as bad, but I do want you to be aware that, you know, maybe later down the road, you might have to do some sort of repair, but I truly think it's good enough as is. So we'll go ahead and do a black light test now. Being a poly finish, it doesn't really glow, but the binding does, so it kind of looks cool. This would be a neat stage effect. It's almost like you just have a neon string of lights around your guitar, all around the neck. It'd be kind of cool if they put inlays on this with the binding material, so it like only glows under black light or something. That'd be cool. It's just kind of a, a little party trick right here for this guitar, not too much glowing. It won't really tell us too much. Take a look at that area here. Got a scratch in there. So yeah, everything's looking good here. This one does come with a gig bag. It's a PRS SE. It's red on the exterior. It's actually a pretty nice little compartment in here. Pretty large, you could fit effects pedals and stuff in here, but it also has like little zippered pouches within there so you could keep all your picks and all that stuff. So honestly, that's pretty nice for a like a student gig bag or something. The interior is just kind of a, a plush black. You can see there's like pet hair and stuff in there. I don't really like pick up any heavy smoke odors or pet odors to the guitar, but it's there. You can see the strings have destroyed the top of the bag right there. Thank you Troglodytes for tuning into this episode of Trade Tuesday Season 2, and we will see you next week with the next one. Take care.